Our next speaker is one of the brightest stars in the mind-body constellation. He is a general practitioner, senior lecturer at Monash University since 1989, and he single-handedly introduced a variety of incredibly marvellous innovations into medical education with an emphasis on the application of holistic, integrative and mind-body medicine. He's written five books, countless articles. Uh, he comes from the most livable city in Australia, Melbourne, my home. He shares, he shares a birthday, get a load of this, with both David Bowie and Elvis Presley. Uh, so if we are, uh, our brain becomes what we focus on, we're all going to become Dr. Craig Hassett. Welcome him. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a real pleasure and an honour to be here. And uh, I think, uh, again, I'd like to add my thanks to also the organisers for uh, organising these wonderful events. Uh, creating uh, tremendous uh, ripples outside of uh, these conference venues. So I'm going to stay to the topic, although um, uh, I've only sort of, um, because of uh, the previous presenter not being able to present today, so I've stepped in, but I thought I'd stay with the same um, bullet points or main points that this uh, talk would be um, uh, about. But mind you, it's going to have a lot of overlap with uh, the previous talk as well about mindfulness. So let's get underway with it. And now, what I'd like you to do first is add up the following figures. So if you could just call them out as we go, all right? So... All right, forget the talk on mindfulness. We're going to go back and do basic numeracy, all right? Um, the first law of performance is to pay attention. It's so easy to make a mistake, isn't it? Um, so easy to make a mistake because we get on automatic pilot and wrote so easily and uh, after a talk on mindfulness, and look what happens. I gave a talk at Treasury a few weeks ago uh, and uh, they made the same mistake, which is... Um, <laughs> which explains a lot about why the books aren't balancing at the moment, but uh, anybody here ever forget where your car keys are? Okay, where's the attention when the car keys are being put down? Probably on the next thing we're going to do or whatever, but not on we're act what we're actually doing at the time. There's no memory without attention as well. Now, paying attention, as you can see, this little fella is an expert at paying attention. He's a real natural and he hasn't done any mindfulness training at all. Uh, the cat's also very good at paying attention as well, but for slightly other reasons to uh, the other little fella. So the first thing to recognise is that mindfulness or paying attention or being present is actually a natural state. It's not an altered state, it's actually a natural state. The altered state or the distorted state is what we've been hearing about, and that's how we start thinking our way out of the present moment at a very early age. There we go. Uh, there we go. So I'm going to try and explain this a little bit more. I think you should be more explicit here in step two. So I'll try and join a few more of the dots as to how not paying attention um, has some very unhelpful effects on mind and body and why paying attention is therefore such a simple generic skill that has so many particular applications. Now what we're creating in the modern world is a, is a situation where we're training short attention spans. This is a paper published in the uh, Harvard Business Review looking at the modern workplace. So, uh, and they coined the term attention deficit tray, the tendency to be less and less attentive in a time pressured, hyperkinetic kind of environment. And it's also associated with a number of other things like black and white thinking. So time pressured, it's this or it's this, quick, make a decision uh, without considering maybe the subtleties or the shades of grey or the need to reserve opinion, and etc. Difficulty staying organised, setting priorities and managing time and a constant low level of panic and guilt. Now, can anybody relate to that at all? <laughs> Probably not the people at these conferences, but anyway, you maybe know somebody who does have uh, an experience like that in your day-to-day -day life. Another issue is multitasking. There's a myth that we become very effective when we're multitasking. As it says here, um, Hewlett-Packard, maybe it wouldn't happen at IBM, I don't know. But anyway, at Hewlett-Packard, workers distracted by email and phone calls suffer a fall in IQ more than twice that found in marijuana smokers. 
I don't think the bottom line of this study is smoke marijuana, don't do your email. I think the, <laughs> the issue is manage the environment that we're being bombarded by, because if we don't manage it, if we're not in control of it, it will be very much in control of us. Um, and this is Clifford Nass, who's done a lot of research in the area, um, so about multitaskers doing five, six or more things at once all the time. It turns out multitaskers are terrible at every aspect of multitasking. They get distracted constantly. Their memory is very disorganised. Um, they're worse at analytical, analytical reasoning. So it's actually a situation where we're training ourselves to work worse, although with the best intentions of the world, we're trying to work better. Multitasking is not such a, a helpful um, thing to be practising. Now, mind you, if by multitasking we mean trying to pay attention to two things at once, because it seems that multitasking in terms of paying attention to two things at once, we can't actually do that. What we actually do is attention switch so free fast is that it creates an illusion we're paying attention to two things at once. Now, that's a very different thing to somebody who's very good at attention switching, who the attention's very agile and can focus on one thing and then very precisely move to the next thing. If you ever hear an athlete talking about being in the zone, they're able to sum up an enormous amount of information in a relative, an extremely short period of time, but that's a very precise state of attention. But multitasking in terms of trying to pay attention to two things at once, we don't actually do that. We can't actually do that. Um, it, but we create the illusion that we're trying to. But what we do when we are trying to pay attention to two things at once is become very inefficient because we lose data every time we switch back and we have to reboot data every time we go off task again. All right, now you failed the first test. I'm going to give you another test. You probably feel like you're doing an exam. All right, multi-choice question. All right, get this right or I'm going home, OK? <laughs> now, this was a study done at Harvard University and they wanted to find when were people happiest. So. Which of the following is associated with the greatest self-reported happiness? So they gave people iPhones, phoned them at random times during the day. At the moment the phone call came in, uh, rate your happiness from 1 to 100, what were you physically doing, and where was your attention? So, uh, so which of the following is associated with the greatest self-reported happiness? Was it A, the mind wandering to unpleasant topics? Was it B, the mind wandering to neutral topics? Was it C, mind not wandering, uh, sorry, wandering to pleasant topics? Or D, mind not wandering from what one is currently doing? Now put up your hand if you're for A, anybody for B, anybody for C, anybody for D. All right, well you know this is a talk on mindfulness, don't you? So <laughs> the answer is D. All those who said C, please go outside and uh, sit, sit and meditate for uh, half an hour and come back in. Um, this was the conclusion uh, of the researchers in this study. In conclusion, a human mind is a wandering mind. Now, has anybody here got a wandering mind? Put up your hand if you have. <laughs> now, there are a number of hands that aren't up. You're the people who aren't even listening to what I'm talking about because <laughs> your mind's already wandered so far away. And a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. The ability to think about what is not happening is a cognitive achievement that comes at an emotional cost. Thinking of what's not happening, not being present, the what ifs and maybes, or going back over the past, etc. Unmindful state. So a now egg is gone, something's going on around here. So as you can see, when we're not paying attention, we leave ourselves very vulnerable to uh, <laughs> threats and dangers that we really should be paying attention to. Now, um, as many of you will know, uh, as it says down the bottom there, Wendell, I'm not content. Uh, as you will know, um, that. Uh, Happiness has not been moving in the right direction, or, or shall we say, increase um, in anxiety and depression and mental health problems has been a trend that's been gathering momentum over about the last 60 years. So, uh, and it's just in the process of depression by itself of overtaking heart disease as our country's number one burden of disease. And um, by the year 2030, these are the predictions of what are expected to be the major burdens of disease. So depression will be way out in front unless we start doing things differently. That's heart disease, dementia, alcohol abuse, etc. These figures don't even take into account that depression's an independent risk factor for all of those other things as well. And if we took that into account, then that would be right through the roof. So, so let's just, a couple of things about the stress response. It says down the bottom there, drive George, drive. This one's got a coat hanger. <laughs> now, he's obviously very good with a coat hanger, so they better get out of there really fast. Now. <laughs> So when we activate the stress response, it's more than adrenaline. 
is a, a rapid um, uh, flowing of, uh, of fuel into the bloodstream, so blood glucose and lipids go up, if you like, or sugars and fats pump into the bloodstream. The respiratory drive kicks in because we need oxygen to burn the fuel, so we start breathing fast. If you're going to be exerting yourself while you're running from a, a lion, for example, you start to sweat to keep yourself cool. The blood's being diverted from the gut and from the skin, so we go pale and the gut shuts down because it's being sent to the muscles because the muscles are really geared up for action. Inflammatory chemicals are pumping into the system to activate the immune system to start mobilising for tissue repair. There's a whole cascade of changes. Blood's getting thick and sticky and ready to clot because you could anticipate some blood loss in a few moments, and uh, so the blood will actually clot faster when we're stressed and when we're not. It's a cascade, it's a, it's a profound change in our physiology, in our metabolism, in our neurology. The attention centre in the brain's lit up like a Christmas tree. He's not thinking about superannuation now. He's very focused on what's in front of him. So it's a global response, it's a life-saving response. It's not experienced so much as anxiety as a turbocharge of energy when we're in this kind of situation. Now, unfortunately, most of the stress we activate is because of the things we anticipate, you know, worrying about future events, the what-ifs and the maybes, whether it's five minutes from now or whether it's five years from now, but we can be worrying about future events or we can be going over past events and beating ourselves up over them. And uh, now, unfortunately, in this situation, we'd say, well, it's a pretty appropriate activation of the stress response, but in these other situations, it's not a helpful activation of the response. When people say stress makes us ill, it's that kind of inappropriate activation that uh, makes us sick. The long-term activation of this response produces a physiological wear and tear on the system that's called allostatic load. It's, a, it's, um, it's like a, a wear and tear. Your mechanic, your car mechanic would say, oh, you're wearing out the parts because you're driving it too hard. So too much adrenaline, too much of this activation of the response. It's associated with immune dysregulation. So we get less defense against coughs, colds, and infections, and we get more inflammation, all right? So stress is a pro-inflammatory condition. Accelerated atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries that leads to heart attacks and strokes. Metabolic syndromes of the high blood glucose, high blood lipids, the high blood pressure, you, GP's always doing um, tests for. Um, bone demineralization, which we otherwise know as osteoporosis. Atrophy of nerve cells in the brain, so we accelerate cell loss. The inflammatory stress chemicals are toxic for neurons, so we accelerate the cell loss, particularly in the hippocampus, the learning and memory center, and the prefrontal cortex. It's a really important area for all of our executive functioning. It's not just in the short term, it's in the long term we impair our ability to function in an effective way. And the amygdala you've just heard about, that's the bit of the brain that grows. We activate it all the time, it gets anatomically bigger and more and more reactive with less and less provocation. We're wiring the brain for stress. Now, I'm figuring by this stage, and mind you, it's not just stress, we're talking here about uh, depression and anxiety and so on, it's all very much the same soup. Now, I'm figuring by this stage of the morning, everybody is feeling stressed and depressed over all of these, um, uh, these findings except that the more optimistic side of the coin is that these are all reversible effects if we learn how to recognise the inappropriate, unnecessary activation of the response and to switch it off. Now, bedtime, Leroy, here comes your animal blanket. Um, <laughs> Leroy's, uh, he needs to do a lot of cognitive therapy. He really <laughs> needs a lot of mindfulness. Uh, so, anyway. Um, this stuff doesn't just affect our muscle tension and so on, it also affects us right down to our DNA. Elizabeth Blackburn won a Nobel Prize for medicine, she's an Australian lady who won that about two years ago, um, for discovering how our DNA ages, so telomeres and telomerase and so on. But people with a disposition towards pessimism by middle age, by about the age of 50, are 10 years older genetically than people with a disposition towards optimism. It's happening, having an effect right down the level of how fast our DNA is aging. Albert Einstein, any man who can drive safely while kissing a pretty girl is simply not giving the kiss the attention it deserves. <laughs> he knew a lot of things, and he certainly knew about paying attention, did uh, Albert Einstein. So mindfulness, as um, many of you will know, it's all about paying attention. It's not a new concept, but unfortunately in that modern well, in the Western world, I suppose that the meditative or contemplative practices around training attention weren't widely known about. So William James, the father of modern psychology, obviously recognised the importance of attention, but the skills and training it weren't known, so it remained a footnote for about the next 100 years. Oh, by the way, she's 130 years old. Um, <laughs> so the applications of mindfulness, 
And these are just some of them, but the list keeps on growing, and the quality of, uh, of uh, evidence for each of these things keeps improving all the time. Particularly, probably more than anything else, the prevention of the relapse of depression, anxiety, panic disorder, stress, emotional regulation. Very important with things like, say, anxiety, depressive thoughts, rumination, as you've just heard, um, is not to fight or wrestle with them, but to learn to recognise them and be less reactive to them. Uh, eating disorders, psychosis, neuroscience, um, and uh, it changes literally the structure and the function of the brain. So you've heard plenty about that. And the more we look at, the more we find. Clinical, for pain management, symptom control, coping with cancer, metabolic and hormonal effects, changes in DNA function and repair, and facilitating healthy lifestyle change. Performance, sport, academic and leadership training, without attention, without focus, we don't perform so well. And we shouldn't forget, of course, that these practices have been around within the spiritual or wisdom traditions for millennia. And from that perspective, all of the above are very much side effects. But each person has their own interest and motivation to practice. So these were some of the, the topics that, um, uh, that um, uh, to uh, sort of examine in this uh, talk. So does meditation practice always lead to focus, attention, emotional balance, compassion, and pro-social behaviours as expected? Well, put up your hand if it does in your experience. Anybody here? Always. Well, very good. Um, you're luckier than I am because sometimes you notice how sometimes your attention's not so focused or sometimes you've got difficult emotions. So, so if the expectation is to experience all of the above, then we're nearly always unsuccessful. If we impose on ourselves an assumption, it has to be like this, and if it's not like that, then I'm doing something wrong, I can't get it right, we can start to get very angry with ourselves, very frustrated, and actually produce the very um, opposite of the thing that we're trying to produce. We can get very tense about trying to relax, for example. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done that. So this leads to frustration, trying harder, despondency, and eventually giving up. The acceptance bit, the not judging. Even when our experience, when the mind's scattered, the emotions are a bit turbulent, learning to cultivate the attitude of, ex of acceptance and not judging that is a very important element. It's not just the attention bit, it's actually the attitudinal bit that really matters. Expectations as well. If success is just about making the effort to practice meditation, with an attitude of acceptance, come what may, then the presence of a distracted mind, uncomfortable emotions and unhelpful behaviours is not seen as failure, it's just how it is. Um, so welcome the opportunity to practise being less reactive to those states. It's easy to think, oh, I'm meant to get rid of that state. But if that state presents, if there's been a background, for example, of, um, say, depressive thoughts and so on, if the depressive thoughts arise, then we can, in a sense, change our attitude to welcome the fact that it's there as giving us an opportunity to get hooked in less and less and less. So bring it on, in a sense, because we're practising being less and less reactive, less and less judgmental of it. So it's not actually necessarily a problem that that stuff arises. So the lesson, the problem is not so much about the states we experience, but the expectations and attitudes we impose. Um, so that's a very important element. Attentional blink as well. So we know that um, uh, when we're processing information uh, that's coming to us, we, have, we get chunks and we miss chunks. The chunks we miss is the attentional blink. If we're stressed, um, then we uh, are much more susceptible to distract your influence and we miss more and get less. When people are trained in attention, um, the attentional blink shortens. So that is, a person misses less, gets more, feels calmer, and is less susceptible to distract your influence. We're more able to discern what needs our attention and what doesn't. In dealing with some of the patterns of thought that you've just been hearing about, this is a really important skill to um, recognise, because all of that other stuff is just really a distraction and irrelevant. Now, this time I won't screw up, I won't, I won't, I won't. Now, of course, Roger screws up. Now, where's Roger's attention right now? Not on task, I suspect, but anyway. Just to give you an example of how, what an impact this can have, a study in US hospitals found that 20% of the resident medical staff at any given time were suffering from clinical depression. They found that the depressed doctors made 6.2 times as many medication and prescribing errors as non-depressed doctors doing the same job. So the most important health tip you're going to get from me today is if ever you wind up in hospital and a doctor walks up to the bedside, do a mental state examination on the doctor, right? <laughs> And if they're stressed and depressed, then you give them empathy and counselling and mind, teach them mindfulness skills, but don't let them teach you or, uh, uh, treat you, right? Because it's a matter of life and death. So this is the classic stress performance curve. 
if we associate relaxation with apathy, then we don't tend to um, uh, think that relaxation is a good thing. Stress will take performance so far, uh, but when we need to go to a higher level of performance, if we've conditioned ourselves to use stress, we think that just more adrenaline is going to get us there, and of course it takes us over the top. The other stress performance curve is when we want to go to a higher level of performance, it's actually more focus that we need. It's getting attention on task. And if ever you hear an athlete, for example, talk about being in the zone, they really describe a, a deeply calm state, but a very focused present state, enjoying the very thing that could otherwise be thought of as stressful. Meditation and cognition. I'm going to move through these studies reasonably quickly, but I just want you to know that the research is there. Um, mindfulness, better moods, less fatigue, the energy burning up in stress is being conserved, less anxiety, but also when you're measuring executive functioning, visuospatial processing, working memory, executive functioning, a whole lot better. Um, I won't go into this too much because you've heard it before, but the prefrontal cortex really matters. Uh, let's see if we can go there. So mindfulness in the brain, again, the areas of the brain are actually not just preserving brain cells, but adding new brain cells, it seems. So neurogenesis, it seems that the brain may actually have the capacity to generate new brain cells in these very important areas for function and management of stress and discernment. Now, using the time he saved by driving home on the new tollway, he said about making a beautiful quilt. But suddenly, out of nowhere, he got quilt rage. <laughs> I, I don't think it's found its way into the DSM-4 yet, but anyway. Um, Dealing with difficult emotions is not easy. Um, this is emotional intelligence, the, the, some of the hallmarks of emotional intelligence. And we know that people who are trained in mindfulness um, uh, are also uh, experience more of what we would call the, the qualities of emotional intelligence. So it seems to map into a very similar area. And empathy is an important uh, thing as well. Mindfulness and doctor well-being. So um, doctors trained in mindfulness become more mindful, you'd hope so. But the more mindful they became, the less burnout, more empathy. If we're paying attention, we tend to experience more empathy. Or the other side of the coin, if we're not paying attention, we don't experience empathy. So um, less mood disturbance and more conscientious about their job, but much more emotionally stable at the same time. Um, meditation and compassion, again, the areas of the brain that um, respond when we experience compassion, so um, become more enlivened. But the compassion is experienced with more, um, how should we say, less stress and reactivity to um, perhaps the suffering a person might be um, in the presence of. This may be very important for carers or health practitioners to be able to maintain empathy, but not to get carer fatigue or carer burnout. Uh, there are not too many people in the world right now, Gladys, who can go home at the end of the day happy in the knowledge that everything is completely stuffed. Um, <laughs> If you really want to be happy, be a taxidermist. Uh, um, amygdala quietens right down if we learn mindfulness, so it quietens right down again as a person recovers from depression. Dumb bunny and smart ass. Um, so, uh, and this is not too far from the truth either. This was a study just a couple of weeks ago. Um, nine minutes of viewing a fast-paced television cartoon, SpongeBob SquarePants, was associated with reduced executive functioning on everything they measured for a four-year-old. For an adult, just two minutes of SpongeBob SquarePants will totally destroy your executive functioning for six months, so don't do that. Leisure activities, if we have leisure activities that engage attention, we preserve brain cells. If our, uh, we don't pay attention, we lose focus and uh, brain cells. So now relax, just like last week, I'm going to hold the cape up for the count of 10 when you start getting angry or put it down. All right, so train yourself in mindfulness. There's a, a little bit I didn't have a chance to get to, but uh, hopefully you'll leave here and, um, and really uh, learn more if it's an area of interest, uh, learn more about mindfulness, paying attention and developing our own brains and capacities. So thank you very much.